to the message. I'd like to call it to rekindle the fire. I want to begin by saying that we need to blow away the ashes of yesterday's fire. There has been a decline, and I'm sure all of us can agree with the statement, there has been a decline in our families. Now when I say our families, I'm not referring to just El Bethel, but I'm referring to families in general more Christian homes than the non-Christian homes. There's been a decline for the last three or four decades. In fact, we have hit rock bottom. If you're of my age, you know what I'm trying to mean this. Or maybe if you're 20 years and below, I'm speaking to those who are 20 years and below, you are missing out on a lot of fun. But first of all, what did I mean by saying you need to blow away the ashes of yesterday's fire? Now, I can remember when I was very little, you know, we have graduated from oven to kerosene stoves to gas stoves. Now we have induction. And I remember when I was very little, my mother used to cook on firewood. Come on, how many of you remember that if you're my age? Amen? That was a stone age. <laughs> my mother used to cook in firewood. It's so vivid to me. I can still picture that oven. And I can still picture my mother putting in wood into the oven. Some people use coal. I put coal. If you work in the railway, you got coal. And the flames are here. Couple of minutes later, there are no flames. What has happened? Ashes covered the fire. And then my mother will take one blowing pipe. <laughs> we take a blowing pipe. You remember that? She so take a blowing pipe and she so start blowing. Sometimes for fun, I used to do it. But what happens when she's blowing on those ashes, the ashes go away and this fire kindles once again. And then she'll put some more wood until the food is cooked. Or we have hot water for bath. And those are good old days. I remember those days. But what I'm trying to communicate this morning is we had to remove the ashes in order to have fire. We got to rekindle the fire. You got to blow away the ashes from the fire in order for the fire to be ablaze. My brother, my sister, I want you to know that ashes is the greatest fire extinguisher. Amen? If ashes cover, your fire is gone. Well, what is it that forms ashes on the fire? Or what is it that could remove the ashes from the fire so that you can have fire blazing 24-7? I'll tell you what can remove those ashes. It's prayer. Amen? If you're a man and a woman of prayer, you're taking the blowing pipe and blowing away the ashes. Amen. You'll always have fire. If you're a man and a woman of the word, if you're a man and a woman who long for fellowship and not have the chairs empty, you see, one of the reasons why we are becoming cold and cold and cold and slowly we dwindle and dwindle and dwindle away because the enthusiasm to come in to have fellowship has gone. Amen? That yearning for fellowship is gone. I love to use the sister's illustration, Gomati, over here. All the way from Vijayanagar, one metro, two buses, one auto, 845. Come on. Your reward is great. You're fanning the fire. 
you are removing the ashes. My sister, I want you to know that when disaster comes knocking at your door, they find no room because they find fire. There's fire in your house. You may be alone. I know you're alone. But yet you're not alone. Amen? Amen? We got to blow away the fire, the ash from the fire. It's through prayer. It's through the word. It's through fellowship. It's being enthusiastic. My brother, my sister, if you have not been witnessing to somebody in the last one month, one month you've been backsliding. And I want you to know if you are discouraged. Anyone discouraged? Yeah, sometimes we go through discouragement. I go through discouragement. Most of us go through discouragement. Because of the happenings, what happens, we are discouraged. Circumstances will bring discouragement. You know, something happens in the family, it brings discouragement. You know, most of the time we are discouraged. But I got news for you this morning. When we are discouraged, when we are tired, when we are exhausted, when we have been tried, my brothers and sisters, when this happens, we take all our discouragement, all our tiredness, and we begin to get it consumed in the fire that we have in our homes through prayer. Go to Acts chapter 6. Let me read from verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among you seven men with a honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we shall give ourselves over continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. What I'm trying to do this morning is to go back into time and bring us back to where we have to be. I want to thank God for this church. I want to salute you people. We have some people at the back who come early in the morning we take care in so many other things. I have Vijay that come over here. I have known Vijay for several years. In fact, I know him before he even started coming to this church. I know him from Hospet. And right from then till now, I hope he won't mind what I say. He's no ordinary person. I don't know how many degrees he holds. He's a chartered accountant right now. But he's so humble to come and take the offering and to serve everyone. To clean the church after you people leave. Amen? I hope he doesn't mind what I'm saying. But I say it. To commend his humility, his commitment. So we have people over here that are committed to, to serving the Lord in the best way they can. We have people that come early in the morning. They take care of the communion, taking care of the church. I, I want to thank God for the choir that come here on Saturday. And for hours together, they are practicing. They are in prayer. I want to thank God for the prayer team. I want to thank God for Brother Ambi and, and uh, Praveen that, that run the prayer ministry. And Brother Ambi that runs the mission ministry. And likewise, if I can name so many of us, each one of us are doing something. But my brother, my sister, it does not stop over there. We go beyond that. What is beyond that? Prayer and the word. Amen. So I'm urging each one of us this morning that let us get ourselves more involved in prayer and in word. What is the result of more prayer and more word? Go to verse 7. It says in verse 7, And the word of God increased, not decreased. It must increase. My brother, my sister, when the word of God increased, I'm not talking about having the word of God served to you on a Sunday morning. It should be uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in your closet. You must be a person of the word. And as you read the word, as you meditate on the word, as you're studying the word, you're fanning the flame. You're blowing away the ashes. And then verse 7, it says, And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. 
the number of disciples multiplied greatly. It did not say the number of the children of God multiplied. My brother, my sister, can you imagine if it has been said that El Bethel have most of them or every one of them disciples? Not sons of God. Not children of God. Or not just servants of God. God is looking and scanning through this congregation and he's wanting to find out how many disciples do we have? Amen? We need disciples. The, the worst thing that's happening in the 21st century, in this era, we are more church shufflers, church hoppers. They don't like the service over here, they join another church. And they don't like the service there, they join another church. And they go from church to church, church to church. And what is happening is the pastors are doing sheep stealing by different kind of advertisement. Amen? Now that is wrong. That's not what the Bible says. It's prayer and the word that makes converts and converts in turn become disciples. Amen. We got to become disciples, my brother, my sister. Let's ask ourselves a question. Am I a disciple? Or am I just a child of God? I need to graduate from being a child of God into becoming a disciple. Amen. Hallelujah. So it says that the word and prayer, you know, Paul says, fan the fire, fan the flame so that the flame will continue to blaze my brother, my sister, we need to do that in our homes. We need to have more prayer in our home. We need to have more word, the word being read in our homes. And, you know, lack of prayer, the family fellowship is breaking. When I look at 30 years ago, over the last 20 years, something has happened to homes. But when I go back 30 years ago, or even a little before that, When I was small, I was being taught that I must be back home when the street lights are on. That was our, our indication to be back home. And what do you think uh, we did when we came back home? When we came back home, and when you came back home, if you're of my age, the full family was there. Amen? The fun was, then after that was over, the family sat at the table. The full family was there. We had dinner, we had laughter, we had joy, we had fun, and you know, it was, it was fantastic. How about today? Today the table fellowship has been broken. You do not get people at the table. Because if Mary is in the house, Tom is out. Amen? And so, different timings. Now, now the cutoff timing, maybe 12 o'clock will be a little early for me to come back home. <laughs> so, they come at each time. And what is even worse, I went to one home, and you know, I went to, went to pray for this home. They got about three or four bedrooms. And so, the mother said, well, pastor, let me get the children out. She took her telephone, calling each child from every bedroom. <laughs> Come, come, the pastor's here, he's coming to pray. Come out, come out, come out. Use the telephone. <laughs> Why? Each one of them stuck in their bedrooms. I don't know what they do behind, behind closed doors for hours together in a room. What I'm trying to say is, the fabric of family fellowship has broken. Amen? So I'm going back to bring us back to where we have to be. My brother, my sister, we need to have that fun once again. Amen. Then there needs to be laughter. We need to hear laughter from our neighbors and, you know, have them being laughing and we are laughing and there's fun. Why? The families come back together. You see, the devil has been doing something and in a way he has succeeded. But we are going to make him fail. In what way he succeeded? You see how tricky the devil is. You know what he's been doing? He sends the husband night shift 
and he keeps the wife day shift. Amen? And sometimes wives will tell me, Pastor, I only meet my husband on Sunday. Living in the same house. Now listen, the danger is this. If the husband is on night shift and the, day, and the wife is on full day shift and they only meet on Sunday, who do you think the wife or the husband is meeting from Monday to Saturday? Is meeting Mrs. Mary. <laughs> so they have more fellowship with one another than what they have with the spouse. Now do you know the reason why there's breakup in marriages? Amen? So, you know, all different timings and different shifts and families are not together. This is what the devil has been doing. And after having done all this, the devil now is standing and he's laughing and he's watching fun that's happening. My brother, my sister, not so in El Bethel. We're going to cancel the assignment of the devil. Families are going to come together. We are going to pray together. We're going to have the word read together. And we are going to stay together. And my brother, my sister, the devil will never succeed. Amen. Can you say another amen? amen? Sunday school teacher one day asked the Sunday school class and said, please tell me the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. And each one gave an answer. Last of all, a little boy stood up. He says, teacher, I've got an answer. She said, yeah, what's the answer? So the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, in the Old Testament, the sheep was slaughtered for the shepherd. In the New Testament, the shepherd was slaughtered for the sheep. That's the difference. Amen? And in the New Testament, the Lord gave his life as a ransom for us. He gave his life so that you and I could be redeemed. He gave his life, my brother, my sister, so that we can be sheltered from every arm and danger like Babu's family. The devil is looking at each one of you and he wants to knock you cold. But I got news for you and bad news for the devil. News for you and me, we have the blood of Jesus. Bad news for the devil, try the next door. Amen, not us. Because my brother, my sister, we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Can everyone say amen? amen? Amen. We're going to get our families together. Let us stop every demon in entering our church, homes, and family. I want you to know that the worst is happening in the day that we are living in. A pastor had a dream one morning or late in the night. And the Lord woke up this pastor, and I got it on my WhatsApp. He woke up this pastor, and he said, I want you to go and pray. And while the pastor was praying, he seen in a vision, he seen a lot of women folk coming out from the sea, walking on the beach. And so he said, Lord, what is this? And the Lord said, they are seducing spirits, being sent to seduce men, and especially men in the church and especially ministers of the gospel. And my brother, my sister, these spirits have invaded churches. And as a result, many men and women of God are falling flat on their faces. This is what is happening. If we don't have fire blazing in this church, if we don't have fire blazing in our homes, we will become victims, not victorious. We need to be victorious. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to do something as I'm about to pray for you. And let's go to the book of Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass when Apollos was at Corinth, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost? Now this is Paul speaking when? After, much after the resurrection of Jesus. Because Paul was, was, was uh, he had a Damascus highway after the resurrection of Jesus. Now he's talking to, Paul is talking to the disciples at Ephesus and asking them a question. 
have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So, the Holy Ghost comes one more time after believing. And they said unto him, We have not even heard of such a thing, whether there be any Holy Ghost. Then he said unto them, Then what are you baptized unto? Very plain question. What are you baptized unto? And they said, John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with repentance, saying unto the people that you should believe on him that was to come afterwards, which is Jesus Christ. Listen, you disciples, this is John's baptism, but do you know after Jesus, John's baptism is cancelled? You have believers' baptism. Amen? You are baptized after you repent. Acts chapter 1 says, Believe and repent and be baptized. You are baptized after you repent. John's baptism, you first baptize and then you repent. Verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. So it's very definite. Paul led them to the Lord. You must accept Jesus Christ. And after they accepted Jesus Christ, and when Paul laid hands upon them, what happened? The Holy Ghost came upon them. So two experiences. Number one, when I accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in me. Amen? I'm born of the Spirit. When I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost, he comes upon me. Is it clear? What is the evidence? Verse 5, verse 6. And Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. We are still in that day. We need a fresh baptism this morning. In this baptism, you are picking up some fire taking this fire back home. Amen? What do you do after it? Fan them. Blow away the ashes. Don't allow ash to collect on the fire. Amen? We need to rekindle the fire this morning. How many of you are ready for that? Hi, this is Pastor George Scotty over here. I'm calling you to be part of our tour to Israel that we'll be having from 7th of October up to the 16th. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy yourself as you tour along with us. I want you to know that I've gone to many countries of this world and wherever I've gone, I felt myself to be like a tourist. But uh, when it comes to Israel, I'm never a tourist over there. The reason being, India is our motherland. But Israel is our father's land. But we're very much at home, so you'll immensely enjoy yourself as we tour and study from the land of Israel at the place where our Lord Jesus Christ himself, where he slept, we sleep, where he walked, we walk, and it's going to be really beautiful. You're going to enjoy yourself even as we cruise over the Nile and we have a cruise over the Galilee and we crisscross the entire land of Israel learning what the Bible has been teaching us. So I request you to come and be part of this wonderful tour that we'll be having. Uh, for more details, you can watch a little clipping that we'll show you after this. Thank you.
Oh 